welcome to the Truth Lover video podcast presented by Love and Truth Party. I am your host, Will Pye, author, speaker, transformational coach, workshop and retreat leader, and founder of Love and Truth Party. You can find out more about me at willpie.com. Love and Truth Party is a self-organizing, self-replicating community and movement of love and awakening, a wisdom school facilitating health, healing, and happiness. You can find out more about us and join our mailing list at loveandtruthparty.org. We exist to empower the deep realization and integration of unitive consciousness of one human being and to inspire action in the world from this clarity as New Earth Ninjas, our playful avatar. Our projects include distributing a million love letters from the universe, inviting people to receive the love and care in these and within the happiness hacks and other free resources found on loveandtruthparty.org. Today we are privileged and I am delighted to be joined by Shelley Sharon. Shelley has experienced life as a dancer, a social science researcher and a businesswoman. And what has always attracted her the most is what it means to simply and beautifully be you. Following a break open in 2011, Shelley dropped her successful career as a business consultant and has been devoting her life to inspiring people to awaken to the power of their feelings, their innate wisdom, and the love that they are. She's fascinated with showing people how to find the life they want through the life they have. Shelley is a contemporary meditation teacher. She's developed a guided awareness coaching system she calls Life Alignment. She leads retreats and works one on one with people worldwide. Her teachings and writings come from a 20-year dialogue between various contemplative practices, especially meditation, art, and poetry. And after a period of three years living as a nomad, mainly in the East, in 2016, she settled in Zurich, Switzerland, where she also offers self-love coaching for executives and has founded the Solpreneur Women's Club for women who lead through their spiritual voice and heart-centered approaches. She's currently in the midst of writing her first book on what it means to live as love, which is a beautiful topic. Welcome, Shelley. It's wonderful to have you here today. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful to be here together with you. And we have a little title, a topic to, to guide our exploration, our conversation today. And it's uh, spiritual maturity. And the great question of love. Yeah. Uh, that, that feels meaty and juicy and, and, and pretty grand, uh, grand. Can you tell me a little bit about what, what's alive in spiritual maturity and the great question of love in your world? Yeah. Yeah, perhaps I'll start by uh, talking a little bit about what, I, what do I refer to when I talk about spiritual maturity. Hmm. Um, we go through different kinds of maturities in life. So the first one that we know of probably is the physical one, when, when our body matures into a place where we can bring life to, to life, right? And then we have all kinds of maturities like social maturity, where we go to build our own social circle. So we leave the... the main hub of family and then we we grow mature through the circles of our friends and and then on colleagues etc um we go through a financial or what i call creative maturity which is the process where we try to find a way in life to make a living out of what we are um what we're talented in, what we are called for, what we're attracted to. And then we go into intimacy maturity, which is where we establish some form of intimacy. I don't want necessarily to exclude that into a partnership intimacy, but this is where most of us tend to lean into. So, mm -hmm. you know, partnerships or uh, raising our, our own families as well. And for most people, this is where it stops. Mm. And for some people, this is where it starts. It's like, oh, there is more to life than this. And this is where 
we would call it a spiritual life, right? The, the, the kind of the horizon beyond the, the financials, the creatives, the colleagues, the friends, to create what I call intimacy with life itself, or to find ourselves belonging to life rather than to a particular group of people. Mm-hmm. So a spiritual maturity is where we really enter this sphere in life that we understand that there is so much more to unfold in our lives and we are able to develop a space that is not segmented around fields of life, but it's much more inclusive. Um, so, so that would somehow be a framework of words to articulate what do I refer to in, in spiritual maturity. And what I'm hearing in that is that this is something that could occur at different ages for different people. I think there's, there's maybe a commonality towards later in life. I know in, in Eastern Enlightenment traditions, that's often the view, right, that you get to 50, 60, 70, and that's when you start to get into spirituality. But I'm wondering for you, is there a bit more of a fluidity around when someone starts to blossom into spiritual maturity? Yeah. I think uh, you're right that perhaps for the majority of us, um, let's say that there is more viable and available energy that flows through one type of maturity rather than other. And this is, you know, for for each of us, it will be different. So Mm -hmm. for most of us, we will have more energy channeled into physical maturity and social maturity and so on. But that doesn't mean that spiritual maturity doesn't start at the age of five or in your first day of life. But there will be more viable and and available energy to flow and be channeled through that stream of maturity at a later age when we are, you know, not so worried about um, uh, how to make a living or we're not so worried about where are we going to live and, and, and all these kind of, you know, fundamental building blocks of, of, of making a life, which, which we cannot ignore. Our, our material and physical life demands some kind of attention. Mm-hmm. So I've heard this uh, beautiful story in one of Tara Brack's uh, talks of a mother who was tucking her little girl to bed. And uh, there was some kind of a conflict between the two of them and the girl was crying and she said, okay, uh, one last story. And then, you know, you go to bed. And then at the end, the the daughter was kind of like still, you know, sniffing with tears. And and she says to her mother, okay, mommy, I forgive you. And (laughs) the mother asks, you know, curious, do you know what forgiveness is? And the little girl says, yes, it's when you're wrong and I'm tired of being mad and I want to go to sleep so my heart can be uh, calm and I want my heart won't have a tummy ache. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But this just, it captures so beautifully the spiritual wisdom that we have at a very young age. Spiritual maturity, and maybe this is a comment that is really worth mentioning, it doesn't mean that there is a right or wrong path. It doesn't mean that there is a bar to cross. It doesn't mean that there is a right way to. It doesn't mean that we're achieving something, that we need to strive for something. It means that that capacity that we have, just the same as the physical capacity and the social capacity, it evolves into something much more mature. Yeah, so from the roots, it grows into, it goes into full succulent fruit. There's a curiosity in this is two pieces that two threads out of that that i want to to tap into one is this sense you pointed to of maybe a a sort of integrating of the spiritual maturity with other domains of our life with perhaps our making a living with our relationships and uh, familial intimate and so on and also the curious sense around 
the evolving of that which we already are or the evolving of of being so you mentioned that we might have that spirit a spiritual something a spiritual maturity and insight at five or that child in that story has you know, a real insight into how people use forgiveness or how, what, what people think forgiveness is and at the same time as the being this this presence this being this awareness this spirit we could say that that we are there is there is this evolving and spiritual maturity sort of points to that it points to an expanding or a becoming of of what we already are somehow i'm intrigued like how do you work with that in either your own journey or or as you're guiding and supporting others in their work yeah it's a beautiful question and a very potent one and it reminds me one of the posts that you posted on the the love and truth party uh, facebook group I uh, can't remember exactly what it was about, but it was like, it takes us, and maybe you can uh, kind of exact me here, it takes us the first 10 years to realize that there is no need for spiritual practice, something like that. Do you remember what was it, what he said? I think it was something like it, it takes 10 years of spiritual practice to realize that spiritual practice is not necessary. Right. And then another 10 years of intense spiritual practice to like really get that on an embodied level rather than just as a sort of nice concept you don't need to do anything sort of thing right exactly and i love that because it's just so it touches truth right so um i'll use one of the the kind of um pointers that one of my beloved teachers told me that at some point the practice um, transforms into inquiry and and this is this is this is how i treat that as well and this is how i you know when, when i work with people either through the retreats or my one-to-one we always dance on that very fragile kind of sewing line between what is practice and what is inquiry mm. So one of the insights that came to me a few years back was that the moment I started believing myself, I slowed down, Hmm. right? And this is, this could be also so practical, like on how many fronts we battle with ourselves, Hmm. on how many fronts we deny ourselves, or we deny ourselves something that we really crave for, that our heart is really asking for on how many fronts do we try to be something or try to be someone which in that particular moment there is already a split in our in our personality in our heart we we live a divided life Mm -hmm. so that transition from practice to inquiry is to dance on that very gentle swing line between where I'm at now and perhaps where I would like to be, but what would come out of the chemistry between the two? Mm -hmm. What would come out of the chemistry between the two? And if to come back to that theme of forgiveness, for example, is exactly what you said. It's the way people understand that. So I have a view that you were wrong and I'm tired of being mad. So I will work through forgive, right? where in fact forgiveness for my understanding is a completely mystical process Hmm. it's not necessarily something that you can work towards the same as you cannot work towards spiritual maturity so if Hmm. i would give a very practical kind of working line quote unquote it would be believe yourself and witness how you slow down and unfold into yourself and what is the chemistry that is born out of these two seemingly separate worlds does that resonate of who you are and who you're becoming as a as a integrated process kind of like the the acorn and the oak are 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 one though they seem so worlds apart or time apart in time that that the essence of one is in is in the other right yeah exactly and that's a very beautiful metaphor you you spoke to the forgiveness and i i want like this is really alive for me i had a a former lover 
reached out to me a while ago and said, uh, by the way, I've forgiven you. And I wanted to say, what for? Like that in my world, I was like, I, well, that's, that's great that you've forgiven me. Um, and, I, and I wanted to create the dialogue so we could explore what, what was happening. And unfortunately, it wasn't possible. And, and recently, a, a communication happened that made it very clear that my sense of what forgiveness is, my understanding of forgiveness, uh, absolutely had not happened. And there was resentment and judgment and a, a narrative or a story of, of who I was or what I had done that was still painful for her. And you spoke to or implied or pointed to the Forgiveness isn't something that we can do. It's a mystical process. Uh, like it's something we ask for help to do, you know, like I have no idea how to let go of this resentment or this judgment, like help me forgive here, you know, evoking our source, presence, spirit, God, whatever we want to language, the ineffable to, to step in. And it feels like that's, within the spiritual maturity as well right we we don't evolve ourselves we might we might be in a time of life where that's the experience that we're like you know really fixed and hard in our meditation or our yoga or our chugong or our dancing or our chanting or whatever practice and yeah that may yield shifts in consciousness and insights and so on but there's a point at which it becomes clear. It feels that like rather than us doing anything, we're, we're being done as it were, you know, that there is this, as you say, sort of mysterious process by which we're being matured as it were. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps it can give, um, let's say, like what I see in front of my eyes is kind of like, you know, a big painting where I can only take my brush and put, you know, one or two dots of colors to kind of accentuate something. So I might try and accentuate that something around forgiveness that, that is part of, of spiritual maturity because I know that forgiveness can be a very tough and painful subject. Mm. You know, when there is, there is um, um, extreme situations in life like trauma and abuse and betrayal and we don't want to underestimate the gravity of the desire to be able to forgive in order to move on and so one of my my private life alignment clients um she was uh, accompanying her dying father and she had a very tough childhood with him he's been very very rigid and she loved him you know, she lost her mother at a very young age. So she, he was all she had left. She was a, sing, she was a single child as well. So, you know, that theme of forgiveness was very alive for her. Not to mention that as life likes to play with us, everything was falling apart to her at the same time. Her, you know, marriage and her child got kind of severely sick. Everything seemed to be falling apart. So when we bring the theme of forgiveness in these kind of occasions, we do want to also bring compassion in the way that we relate to it. Mm -hmm. One of the, the aspects that we worked on is to try and bring awareness to what doesn't feel complete in that relationship. So completion is, is one of the aspects or one of the dimensions that would lead us eventually towards forgiveness. What doesn't feel complete? Because forgiveness is, is, is that desire for completion, right? So we can also have the, the desire to get rid of the suffering mm. from the hurt, but it has a very genuine, that spiritual wisdom that we see at the age of three or four or five, that forgiveness is really a crucial part of life, not because the other is wrong and I'm right, but because there is something incomplete in that relationship. Mm -hmm. And the incompletion cannot be embodied or understood even through the, the beautiful mind that we have through dividing the relationship to right and wrong, should and shouldn't. 
He, he did, I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A sense of completion is something that we can, we can insight into through bringing more awareness to the dynamics of a relationship. Uh, Which sounds like a, a, a perfect segue into the second part of our topic, right? Uh, not to close that one off, but to broaden the, the field. The, the great question of love. I like how you, you have posited that, the great question of love. I mean, it is such... Uh, we were talking earlier before we jumped into the recording about language and you know, love is, is right up there with enlightenment or God. It, it's, it's such... Uh, has so many different meanings for so many different people and it feels like in a sense of love with a capital L and spiritual maturity what we're touching on here like creating completion in in relating in relationship is the discovery perhaps or the or the restoration or, or the, the the evoking of love the evoking of the the, the deeper truth that exists in apparent relationships between separate people yeah yeah and I, I think i can i can also pull that thread of completion into that conversation as well and i'll perhaps push myself into a challenge here when i'm going to actually bring that theme of unconditional love which is <laughs> which is the 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 final chapter of my my book about love without capital l I think that our general understanding of unconditional love or our desire to, to feel that kind of complete love is to, is, says the following. I can always love and feel loved in any kind of circumstances. The painful and hurtful circumstances of life will not eat up from my capacity to bring love and we all know that this is a very romantic concept that is absolutely impossible to practice. <laughs> what I would see as an unconditional love is that embracing that as long as we are in life, we are not complete and we will never be complete. Because as soon as we arrive to some kind of an insight, some kind of understanding, there's a whole new world of inquiry that opens up to us, right? And each time we step into that world, we feel that we're being driven or motivated by that, what I would call divine desire to look for for that completion and as we've reached some kind of sense of completion it keeps on unfolding and unfolding so the unconditional love that i that i understand that great question of, of love is that love is much more than a verb it's not about the loving and being loved it's not necessarily just the thought process that transformed into, transforms into an action. But it's an existence. An existence always moves, always shifts, always opens up, always cracks and breaks open. It always, and, and it always leaves us a question, not as an answer. Yeah, we see that in the natural world with uh, the cycle of seasons. There's, there's, there's birth, there's death and, and repeat, right? And the universe we know now is expanding uh, exponentially. It's ever becoming more than what it is. So it feels pertinent to, to look out to those macro cosmic perspectives and recognize as you're pointing that the spiritual maturity isn't, the end point there's no end point every insight it's like a, a computer game you know you complete one stage or one level and it's like yeah i'm done but then it's like on to the next one on to the next 
process the next game. And it seems that love is so vast, so uncontainable. My, my view is kind of like if we're in a body, then by definition, we're not complete, right? There's, there's more, there's more. There's more to discover, embody, express, mature into. Yeah. Yeah. And, and perhaps you can also use, you know, a personal example um, to kind of also put it into the real life perspective, because sometimes um, we can listen to these kind of conversations and we ask, I know that I can ask that, you know, okay, so, but what do I do without in my life? How do I actually leave um, love as a question? What does it mean and how does it help me? Mm. Yeah. This is, um, this is one of the, the, the things that kind of brought me to write a book about love and, 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 and what does it really mean and how do we actually live life from that? Because I've always lived my life under this pressure that that something something is just uh, missing something is wrong like of oh whatever i was doing wherever i was at even if it was good like a good social interaction or or a good intimacy i would always feel like i'm going to hit up a wall where i'm not going to be able to surrender i'm not going to be able to give myself i'm not going to be able to commit gosh commitment was like one of the biggest monsters and demons for me and so i would just run away and the last thing on earth that i thought was that love is actually the answer to all my you know difficulties and challenges in life it's, it seems like such an uh, aloof notion that we reach after we have figured out everything and after we have solved all our problems and after we've crossed all the kind of the more practical and nitty gritty problems of, of life. So I grew up um, with my mother and my mother has been suffering from mental uh, disorders that um, allowed her to be there for me only partially. And a few years back, I was doing all kinds of stuff to try and forgive her because I was hurt in many ways. You know, genuinely, I was hurt. And I went to all kinds of healings and shamanic journeys and therapies and coachings and retreats and whatnot. Now, of course, each one of these steps are adding something that at that particular moment, we don't know how that piece of the puzzle fits into that great question of love, that unfolding question mark that we have in our lives, that when we are okay with it, that we can say, okay. So In one of those moments in, in time, in that period of time when I said, you know, I started believing myself, so I kind of like started slowing down and falling back into myself, there was that question of what is it that I really need from her that would allow me to forgive her? So the obvious question was love. So I asked myself, but is it true that my mother doesn't love me? And I just couldn't answer that with a definite yes or no. You know, like, is it true? No, it's not true. Oh, yes, it's true. And that in-between zone allowed me to start asking a whole new series of questions like, you know, how do I actually want to experience her now when I'm, when I'm a mature, grown-up person? How can I experience that love in that in-between zone rather than a personal love that she gives to me and I give to her? Yeah. How can I 
open up to the potential that if you know, I just wrote about it this morning that these 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 um, senses or feelings of being abandoned that we all deal with to you know smaller or greater extent we all deal with and it is triggered in different kind of situations that human yearning to not be abandoned is in itself the potential of completion is in itself the potential of love with a capital L so you know we speak about non-duality this is this is where it falls onto onto itself that in between zone where a lot of other questions can surface up and will lead us into a completely unexpected inquiry and unexpected understanding that you know what at one day i find myself not being triggered when i speak to my mother and she tells me the first thing in our conversation you never call me i never hear from you i'm not angry i'm not hearing judgment i'm not i'm not hearing an, an anger oh but you are the one that needs to take care of me and not me of you and, and all that kind of you know resentment and at the end of the conversation i'm able to say to her i love you so that that transformation or that transition matures after we have opened up into that in-between zone the, the the space that doesn't have definition that we call non-dual in some traditions we call the um we, we call enlightenment in other traditions we call um, god in different traditions you know we try to capture us with words and this is also a very beautiful reflection of how language can be so articulate and be so accurate and be so gentle and it will always leave a margin of a door open to what is not being able to express and captured through words it's a mystery of the the speaking and the writing and the communicating that words are inherently incomplete and what I, what I feel and sense in, in what you're pointing to is the the deeper listening for the for the space between the words as it were or the the energy behind the words or the the emotion or the sensation that's coming with the words and also something of like that that metaphor we were touching on the the, the oak tree and the 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 acorn the it's not that much of a, a stretch to imagine that the that, that love plays a key role in that you know the oak tree's love of becoming the oak, the acorn's love of becoming the oak tree or the oak tree's love for the acorn that it was that 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 movement of evolution that movement towards the the sun and the rejection and abandonment piece i think that's interesting that you're saying that if i'm hearing you correctly there's something in that there's a seed in that that is its own fulfillment as it were there is something in the rejection that's universal right we're, we're all born we're all expelled from the womb um and experience just really varying degrees of trauma hardship suffering in our childhoods uh, rather than some do and some don't and it i think there's something really deep for me in, in that pointing that in in the rejection or the abandonment or the fear of rejection or the fear of abandonment that there is there's something sacred there is a uh there there, there, there is love yeah yeah i i think it also speaks to um our human desire to be defined 
Mm. So, you know, if we, if we look at ourselves, another perhaps a concept that is um, not so easy to digest and definitely cannot be understood through thought processes that we're all one. Mm. Right? So here I, I look at you and I have a very defined screen of a computer. And you have a very defined body of your own. You're sitting there somewhere in England and I'm sitting somewhere here in Zurich. And everything around us is defined, right? And so we live in a world of definitions. At the same time, our inner life is not defined. It's it's not defined and spiritual life is not defined. So if we said that we try to point to some concepts or some pointers um, through the words of enlightenment or through the words of non-duality or through the word of of God or even through the word of of love. It is that craving to have some definition where we would feel belong. Hmm. (sighs) Feel safe perhaps on safe on some sort of safe ground. Yeah. If I'm defined, if I know where I'm, where I'm at, if I know where I stand, if I know what my definition is, then yes, I'm safe, I'm secure, and I also have a sense of belonging, I know where I belong to. Like we spoke earlier, I'm, I'm here in Zurich, and I, I'm constantly struggling and trying to find a definition for what I do. Mm. And I've played with a spiritual teacher and a therapist and a coach and a healer and whatnot. And I'm never, ever satisfied with any of these definitions. And I know I'm being scorned completely now, you know, by all the marketing experts. I may not do any justice to the the service that I provide. But I think, and I can see you smile, because I think so many of us can resonate with that so deeply. That on one hand, the, the, the contradiction of life that we live, that I'm pointing to, that on the one hand, there is a need to define. So we know where we're at. Am I north, south? I'm loved, I'm not loved. I'm this, I'm that. I'm after, I'm before. And the absoluteness of life that is always evolving, always changing, always decomposing and, and becoming something new. And that contradiction is one of the most beautiful contradictions of life that Leaving that, actual living that in everyday life is what I would call an inquiry of love. I notice I didn't say practice of love. It's an inquiry of love, right? There was something else that I wanted to say about that. Yeah, we, we, we started talking earlier about how language captures perception, right? And those very words are interesting, right? Captures, yeah. something in the word captures. And in our language that we're using now, at least, I know you speak Hebrew and some, some German. Yeah. <laughs> in English, the separation appears to be especially accentuated or affirmed or reinforced through subject object being a requirement of every sentence right so in non-dual circles it creates this humor when people try to speak of oneness unity the non-dual utilizing a language that is inherently dualistic that is left yeah it's, it's affirming again and again you and me this and that subject object um and uh, so that word captures feels like it, it's like it sort of captures us or imprisons us in some way uh, in the same way that language can be liberating can be freeing yeah i love that so much will this is just uh, it resonates with me so deeply and i think that that sometimes we as as um as spiritual walkers on this in this life we put so much emphasis on this body rather than saying my body you know what's the problem with that like there is so much preciousness about using particular kind of language which i call conceptual talk it's just like you you can 
and feel that, that, that separation. So if I look into that capture, what it brings to my mind is that desire to belong, right? If we, we talk about the world of definition and the, the, the constant contradiction that we live in, the, the, the alchemy between a world that is completely defined and an inner world or a spiritual world or outer world or the consciousness, call it whatever, is the undefined world. And that contradiction between them, oftentimes we, we relate to belonging as capturing something, mm -hmm. right? I want to be safe. Mm -hmm. I want to feel that I'm accepted by a particular group of people, my family, my friends, my colleagues, my, my city, my spiritual community. I say um, that that kind of perspective of belonging, which is a captured belonging to my understanding, is actually what we're looking for is a guardianship, not belonging. Hmm. It's like some Thing, like entity or someone, a, a, a person, that will spread their wings over me and give me that sense that I'm always understood and I'm always, I always have a, splay, I have a space and I'm never going to be lost and things will fall into place. That kind of promise, right? That we wanted from mummy or daddy and, of course, never got in the completeness that we desired it. Right, right. Where I find the inquiry into belonging to life much more fascinating and rewarding, much more fulfilling. Like, what is it that I belong to that is actually not wrapping me with, with with um, big, white, beautiful, angelic wings and defines my space, but rather draws me into something that is bigger than I am. Yeah, there's so, a beautiful imagery in that. They, they, they're being contained and they're being expanded and this it feels like that's very much the energetic of the great question of love, the spiritual maturity, the evolving, the expanding, the being more being. <laughs> you know, this, it's this uh, language fails me. Um, belonging to the nothingness, belonging to the not knowing. There's a curious way that that seems to be um, possible to belong to the undefined. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I see that the, the gesture that you do with your hands, that really reminds me, the, the pumping heart, the pulsating heart. And this is why I love meditation so much, because there is so much treasure in that simplicity of being with a breath mm. and really embodying that wisdom of expanding and collapsing, of breathing in and breathing out, of taking in and spitting out of being abandoned and abandoning at the same time that repetitive cycle of going in and out and knowing and not knowing and being defined and not being defined breaking through boundaries and creating new boundaries that that beauty of that cycle really speaks to me when, when I see this beautiful gesture that, that you do with, with your hands. And also perhaps reminds me that how, again, quote unquote, high up we, we, um, we soar with our conversation, it really dives back to a very simple gesture of being alive. <laughs> I posted this wonderful Hafiz quote that feels resonant with, with this, the simple, uh, I forget the words, it's on my Facebook wall if you want to have a look later, and it's something like just this stopping, resting, uh, just being here alive, you know, just, just this, 
the the indescribable experience of of being and breath of course is just that thread that anchor that ever present expression of evidence of if you like love we could say you know like wow i'm being breathed i'm being given another breath in this very moment yeah. um wow <laughs> thank you <laughs> I wrote a poem a few days ago in that came out from the same atmosphere, if you wish, or the same winds of of the kind of conversation that we are having. So, if if I if it's okay if I read that, of course. So it goes more than anything to live an authentic life is to move from moment to moment, from gift to gift, from seed to blossom, from lips to kiss. As if death is not waiting around the corner and the days that passed cast no shadow on a present breath. So the missing piece kindles the seen piece and the voiced piece leans on the unknown piece or the one that hasn't come yet, or the one that fell for lack of hope. That's beautiful. I was hearing peace spelt two ways, as P-I-E-C-E and as P-E-A-C-E. How is it written? Yeah, well, it's written as I-E, but when I when I stood, so again, this is, you know, this, this definition, one of the things that I sometimes do is that I kind of like a play with the way that I, mm. that I pronounce the words that are written that doesn't allow me that, that, you know, that, that gentle differences that you can, you can take it as, as, as you want or as your ear is receptive to it at a particular time. Um, when, when you listen to that, that does that, I can't really do that in writing and that these two different dimensions allow me that play. Yeah, I love that. It's like in, in visual art, uh, of course, this phrase that beauty is in the eye of the beholder and the interpretation is, is true so far as it is true for the subjectivity of the experiencer. If the Mona Lisa is smiling for you, then she's smiling for you. Exactly. Um, if she's got an enigmatic or maybe sad look for you, then that's true also. Yeah. Yeah, one of, one of the creative projects that I'm that I'm engaged with now, and I'm um, aiming to kind of launch it around November, so towards the end of the year, is a space I call Meditate with Me, um, which doesn't refer to the me, this this moi that that sits here, that's called Shelley, but it's more like an invita an open invitation, and I'm working with a creative photographer to to capture not the pose of meditation, but what happens behind the scene. Mm. So I'm choosing kind of like five main qualities that I feel that meditation actually is um, facilitating for us in life, which are creativity and courage and passion and, and qualities that are let's say a little bit less austere and clinical than the one that we normally have in the, the, you know, the image of the meditator, this kind of, you know, the, the, the eyes closed on the peak of the mountain in Nepal and, and, and so on. The transcendent, the empty, the still and so on. Yeah, that doesn't want, the, the one that doesn't, you know, is not being touched by life suffering and shame mm. and anger, frustration and, and is not mm -hmm. being, you know, that, that, his or her love is is untouchable and unbreakable and, and so mm. on. And, and we know that there is just so much movement inside. So the idea is to um, to capture through movement and, and photography that inner movement that is embodied in that contained still posture of meditation. Mm -hmm. which that doesn't have to be embodied through sitting down to meditation but that moment or gesture or, or quality of meditation are those moments where there is an 
intimacy with what is, just like now. And we don't have to sit with our eyes closed and, and refrain from getting in dirty mm -hmm. in life. But we're risking exposing ourselves into that intimacy with what is. So the words, the, the written word, the, the, the hug, the walking, the painting, the dancing, the screaming, the, the tears, the, the washing the hands, the drinking the water, whatever it is. I love that. It sounds like a, a wonderfully ambitious project just as this podcast is and so this dialogue is in some ways, right? To hope in, you know, an hour or so or whatever to do justice to these great themes of spiritual maturity and the great question of love. But I've enjoyed the dancing and it feels like we've touched on some juiciness and I'll, I'll look forward to seeing the, um, the photographic creative project and your your book when it's complete do you know when it will be complete is that timeline is that still uh, the unknown emerging it's uh, the unknown emerging and i have to confess that i'm at that stage where i need to start reaching out for um either a publisher or a book agent is there anyone in the audience who is either of the two and <laughs> is happy to reach out <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in that stage where, where I'm ready to and I'm, I'm, and I'm actually preparing myself to, to reach out to either one of the two. So this, uh, this book can also have some frame of, of coming to light, not just on this desk, but also um, in this big, beautiful world. Beautiful. Well, may it be so. I hope to hear in coming days after this is published and released that a synchronistic connection has emerged. I look forward to reading and hearing more of your creative expressions. And thank you so much for joining us today, Shelley, and bringing such richness and, and beauty and nuance and texture. I've really, really enjoyed the time with you and the exploration. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity for us to, to, to get into a conversation with life in that way. I really cherish that. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. It's been a personal pleasure. This is one of the ways that I catch up with my friends around the world these days, it seems, is like, let's have a great chat and we'll record it and we'll call it a podcast. Um, for everyone who would like to get in contact with you, of course, I'll be able to find your website and details in the, in the show notes. And yeah, thank you again, Shelley, for being with us. It's been a, a joy and a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to our viewers and our listeners as well for joining us on this edition of The Truth Lover. You can visit loveandtruthparty.org to find more beautiful guests such as Shelley today, to download or order love letters, to register for our newsletter, connect on social media, and even consider a financial gift at loveandtruthparty.org. Thank you to all our existing supporters and contributors. Together we are creating kind, conscious, and courageous human community. Mm -hmm.